Hey everybody, welcome back to Digital Health Entrepreneurship with Lawrence Gerard. On today's episode, we're gonna talk about something very interesting, which is product design. Lawrence, this is something you're really passionate about and you're probably even more involved maybe than other CEOs. And so tell us why is this an important issue for uh, us to be talking about this area of product design? I mean, product design, probably determines the success or failure of your business because if you don't have a good product, it's unlikely that you're gonna have a good business because no one's gonna buy your products and you're not gonna have any repeat customers. And so if you have like a really good idea, but then maybe the product is just like mediocre, do you think a lot of great ideas just don't go anywhere because of bad product? Yeah, I mean, that's. That happened with my company, basically. I mean, I hired a software development firm in the Philippines and uh, the product just was not well designed. Um, and, you know, the engineering also was not perfect. But, um, I mean, what's the difference between a good design and bad design, right? I mean, you know, Fruit Street hired, you know, IDEO, which is I-D-E-O, one of the most famous design firms in the world that designed Amazon Pill Pack and um, the first Apple mouse. And we, we hired them to build this new COVID MD product. And, you know, these are expensive designers, right? You're talking like six figure amounts per week in some cases. We're just a very small team of a few people, but the process that they use for design is so good that the quality of what they deliver even in a few weeks was so good that it allowed us to land you know, a contract that is worth millions of dollars. So initially I think people, you know, that kind of an expense is like, you know, why would I pay, you know, a million dollars over the course of 16 weeks when I could just hire someone in the Philippines and pay them $25 an hour and just tell them my ideas and they would make some visuals. Well, the reason why is because that person in the Philippines is not trained in design thinking and doesn't have the experience in going through a design process is going to result in a world-class product. So what, what are some of the other distinctions between, say, a uh, designed uh, idea you know, from, from a different company, maybe overseas, or IDEO? Like, is it the wireframes? Is it the uh, extensive surveying of potential users of the system? Uh, what's some of the other distinguishing factors? I mean, I think it's just the process. So... You know, the first step that the IDEO takes is not, uh, let's just, you know, make a bunch of sketches of all of your ideas, which is basically what somebody in the Philippines would do. Um, you know, what IDEO would do is to say, you know, let's meet with the different stakeholders of this product, physicians, patients, right, business stakeholders, and let's interview them and figure out, like, what's important to them. You know, what do they think is the problem with the current healthcare system if you were going to design a telemedicine product? what's important for a physician and you ask, you know, 10 physicians and then you ask 10 patients, what's important to you there. And then you ask the business owner like me, you know, what do you want to see in the product? What are your uh, metrics of success in the business? Right. And the product is designed around the answers to those questions rather than just the founder, just thinking what they have is a good idea. I mean, there's so many, you know, entrepreneurs just think, oh, well, if I just build what's in my head, everybody will love it. And they, you know, will spend six to 12 months just building, 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 writing code, writing code, writing code, designing, 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 but they never get out into the world and show it to a single customer. And if they would have done that from the first week that they had the idea, that feedback could have informed the product design. I want to riff on what you just said. You talked about code a couple of times there. Let's talk about intellectual property. In your specific um, uh, work with audio, like who owns the IP? Is it Fruit Street all the way? Do they own some of it? Do they, and you know, what, what's the deal there? Uh, it's, no, it's Fruit Street. I mean, you're, it's a work for hire contract. You are you know, paying someone to work with you. That's not always the case. Like I've been in other contracts where, um, you know, you own just like the design, but you're licensing the product, right? Um, so it is important that when you enter into a contract with anyone, whether it's an employee or a contractor or, you know, anybody that you're paying that you own the intellectual property, 
uh, when possible. If you don't have that, then you might not own the intellectual property. So they have what's called an invention assignment agreement. <laughs> but I think another interesting thing to talk about is like the lean startup movement and kind of, you know, what does that mean? Um, you know, cause basically it was started by Eric Ries and what it means is that, um, I think they call it the uh, build, measure, learn feedback loop. So the idea is that you build something, maybe it's just a clickable wireframe with no code. Um, you show it to people and you measure their usage of it. And then you, you learn something, right? And then you go back to the beginning and you build something again based on what you learned and you just keep doing that indefinitely. And it's kind of this change in philosophy to where a lot of business learning for ages was, hey, let's set this big goal you know, let's accomplish this in nine months or let's launch this product in nine months. Then you reverse engineer that and okay, let's get our whole team working on it for the next nine months. And then you launch and hopefully what you've been working on for nine months works. Like hopefully people like it, but if they don't, then it takes you, you know, you go back to the drawing board. So talk to us about how it changed the whole, like this lean startup methodology of iterating quicker, going in sprints, learning as fast as you can, how it changed really a lot of ways that businesses did things from this more like long-term build over time approach. I mean, some people won't even start a business until they show, you know, clickable wireframes of their app to end users. They can just, they, I mean, you can even do sketches and be like, okay, click on this piece of paper that has a fake button. And then I will show you in the next screen, right? It doesn't even have to be on a computer necessarily. Um, so I think it allows you to, prove or disprove your hypothesis faster without a lot of money invested into anything. And then once you get to the stage where you have a functional product with users, instead of like doing, you know, a software release every three months, you're doing software releases every day and you're, you're interviewing users on a regular basis and you are watching users click through your product with, you know, technology tools like full story where you can watch users click on a product. Um, but um, it's not just like software. Like some people think that Lean Startup is about like software design. It's more about like business design, right? So, yeah. That's what I've seen too is uh, I've, I've worked with software clients and they've used it, but it seems like Lean Startup is more and more beginning to bleed into recognizing like, oh, this is just a really good way to manage projects and stuff. You mentioned that when you, you know, your team, the IDO, they interviewed you and they interviewed other stakeholders and stuff. When they talk to Lawrence and they say, hey, Lawrence, what are, what's important to you, the products for your company? Like, let's talk about COVID MD, for example. Um, you know, obviously there was other opinions and other ideas too, but what was important to you from a product design standpoint going into the launch of that product? Um, that we approach the product design in a scientific way, <laughs> right? So it's not, it's not about like what I think, right? It's about what doctors think, what patients think, what um, employers and health plans think, right? Because if you have a big ego and you're designing products and you're just going to do it your way, no matter what the data says, then you're not going to get very far, right? So you have to be willing to throw your ideas in the garbage if they're proven through something called the scientific method to not be good ideas. <laughs> Lee, I, Lee and I saw that in the publishing industry, like where the previous job that we worked on together, we talked to these authors, um, you know, we'd be talking to them very early stage in their book. They was just an idea and they'd say, I have this great idea for a book. It's, you know, it's unshakable and it has my face on the cover and it's going to sell a million copies. And be like, well, what's the book about? And they're like, I, I don't know yet. They don't know what the book's about. They don't know. They don't realize like, well, your face on the cover is only going to sell if millions of people walking through bookstores and airports know your face. Like they're not going to stop for a stranger. And we saw this all the time where people had this idea of a book or in your case, this idea of what a product looks like because that's what they want. And they never even think about what does the end user want? What is the... Yeah. I mean, I think the amazing thing also is the amount of not days, not weeks, not months, but years people waste building companies where they do not use this process. Like, 
there was a situation where a doctor had this idea that he wanted to work on and it was like an idea and um you know that the investors who were doctors invested hundreds of thousands of dollars in building software for this idea because they believed that it was a good idea and something they would personally use in their medical practice but the problem with this project was that um they never hired a salesperson and actually sales is an important part of product development because you're testing if someone will pay for the thing that you are building and through the sales process you will learn what their objections are and then those objections might turn into oh well we can change the product or the pricing or whatever it is build a new software feature to address their objection to overcome their objections so maybe the customer wants you know a telephone conference bridge and a telemedicine product or maybe they want EMR integration and so you can overcome those objections but if you don't ever engage in sales you're not going to get the idea for your new features i mean where do you think you know most software companies get ideas for new features from is it from the management team just like you know going to the bahamas for a week like no it's from you know their users complaining or from their users requesting something that doesn't exist in the product and sometimes it comes from like a true innovation of like the founder or like someone on the design team but i would probably guess that 80% of new product features come from either problems users are having or things that users are requesting so if you don't ever engage in a sales process for a new product you're not going to know what real people want in your product and you're going to waste years of your life just building something and never showing it to anybody well, I like a, I like you would explore like a practical example, like COVID MD, for, for instance, has a virtual waiting room where people digitally just hang out for a while while they are connected to a physician to assess their risk. Like, how do you, how do you collate and analyze all of the dozens, if not hundreds, of opinions that relate to a digital virtual waiting room? for patients to wait for doctors. Like, how do you, how do you apply the scientific met method there? Is it just, is it the statistical, statistically you just tally them? You know, like, what do you do? I mean, you can use tools like Optimizely to run an A-B test. So if you think that like one version of the user flow is gonna result in more people ultimately seeing a doctor or paying, then you can test that hypothesis, which is hypothesis A, against hypothesis B, which is completely different. So like one of the things we're thinking about now is do people still really want to take a risk assessment for COVID-19 before they talk to a doctor? Or do they want to just talk to a doctor, right? And what results in more people ultimately talking to a doctor or having a good experience? So we're running a B test within the product of Optimizely. And Optimizely will tell you when you hit statistical significance. And it's not like 100 people. It's like 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 people going through the product and we get that traffic from social media advertising um but um basically you know you have you have that quantitative method and then you have the qualitative method through a tool like full story where you're watching users click through the product so something we just discovered was that people don't like giving their exact date of birth and the first thing we were ask, asking them was what's your exact date of birth so now we're doing an a b test where we're putting an age range which we use to calculate their risk and and so um I mean, probably big tech companies have people that are full-time. Their only job is to watch full story videos with just users clicking around and just sit there and come up with like 12 different hypotheses per day that can be tested in optimizely. I mean, there's probably people that that is literally the job just to watch user stories. But now I want to talk about what about all the noise you, you perhaps get confronted with from physician investors, I'll be just direct who might say you should definitely add this or you should definitely subtract that or you should emphasize this or de-emphasize that like an example is i know some uh, some of your physician investors are in a vocal about having a new sort of segment on covid md or like an update segment where they've got information from the cdc just almost like it's scrolling or something like how do you how do you how do you you know what am i what am i like? Or a bad idea. Yeah, yeah. How do you, yeah, how do, and how do you politely, as a CEO, say no, thank you to to people who are so? Um, well, I, I don't say no, thank you. I say um, 
you know, Fruit Street has a culture of experimentation and hypothesis generation. And, and I mean, obviously at the end of the day, you can have an unlimited quantity of hypotheses. And, you know, at the end of the day, you need a management team and you need a VP of product that decides based on their experience, what hypotheses seem to be the most promising. And so there is some amount of intuition, but, you know, ideally a company would have a hypothesis backlog, right? And you would have literally a list of like a thousand hypotheses. You'd have an email address. In fact, this is an idea I just made up, but I think we should do it. Uh, you know, it should be like hypothesis at fruitstreet.com and like anyone, like a doctor, an investor, an employee, a contractor. I mean, if, if you get out of a way where patients could do that, right? Anybody could submit um, any, you know, an idea there. On the patient side, it'd probably be like, you know, a feature request or something, right? Um, but ideally, you'd have a backlog of hypotheses. And at the end of every year, you'd say, well, you know, one of our metrics of success is not just like gross revenue, which is such an ancient way of looking at things, but like how many hypothesis tests, because if you tested, you know, a thousand or 10,000 hypotheses a year, you'd probably figure something out that is quite valuable that would generate revenue. I mean, you can't really argue with testing. Like, I feel like if you build a product based off of what you think looks really good, that's up for debate and your investors can debate it and your employees can debate it and stuff. But I think it's really wise what you've done of emphasizing testing so much because I mean, like data doesn't often lie. So if you have data to support what lying is the way it is, that goes a long way. Well, yeah, I mean, you have an argument again because you can just say we'll do some testing and then we'll determine who's right based on what the actual data is. So Lawrence, how do you, how do you ensure that design is cost efficient and cost effective? Uh, you make every design about testing a hypothesis because if you're not working towards proving or disproving a hypothesis, then you're just, you're not really accomplishing anything. I mean, the purpose of product development should be to prove or disprove things that you believe to be true. Um, so, you know, you could sit there all day and pay someone a quarter of a million dollars to make your website look pretty, but if it's not driving actual customers to sign up, what did you, what did you really accomplish? So I find that the process of experimentation makes the cost cheaper because you drive towards a statistically significant result faster. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. And again, the importance of testing so that you're not wasting money on things that people don't like. So this is a this is a quick dive into product design. There's obviously so much that we could talk about, but as we bring this conversation to a close, how uh, what would what would you say to people that are listening that they definitely have a product idea, or maybe they're even in the early stages of working on an app? Everybody can't hire IDO. Um, maybe some people listening are already hiring people in the Philippines. Like for people that are like, I want to build this product what would kind of your first one or two steps of encouragement be for them? Um, stop building your product and read a book called The Lean Startup. I love it. <laughs> Anything <laughs> else you want to say there? No, that's it. That's the only thing they should do. Stop what you're doing and read The Lean Startup. And then when you're done listening to it, listen to it again and take notes. I like it. It's, it's that good of a book. It really is. So we will have the, uh, we'll have the link in, in the show notes for that book. But if you have any interest in business or product design, then I agree with Lawrence. That book is an absolute must. Agreed. All right. Thanks so much, Lawrence, for uh, taking us down the road of product design. It's fun to see your products develop. Uh, and especially with COVID MD, just how fast things are changing. It's amazing what the design team has done. So thanks for sharing some of your insight today. All right, we'll talk soon. Mm -hmm.